us. You're all set. Okay, so welcome everyone to the uh, second workshop. Um, hopefully, you know, more people will be watching it online. So uh, to recap the what we did in the in the first workshop. Oh, by the way, you you will learn how to take pictures like this. You know, by the end of this workshop, uh, this one will be much more about astrophotography than general explanation of telescopes. Uh, and this is, by the way, taken in Kazakhstan, uh, next to my hometown. Um, yeah. Uh, so in the previous workshop, we learned quite a lot about telescopes in general, uh, and quite not 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 a lot about astrophotography. Um, so th there are very few key things from previous workshop that you need to know uh, before going forward. One of them is the different types of telescopes. As we said, there are refractors and reflectors. There are, uh, you know, two main types of refractors is a achromatic and apochromatic. The apochromatic, they have corrected uh, chromatic aberrations. Then there are three different types, main types of reflectors, the Newtonian, Cassegrain, and Schmidt. Uh, within those, the only one, you know, I would recommend for beginner astrophotography is the apochromatic refractor. The problem is with the reflectors, they're perfect, you know, they're great, they have big aperture, but they're really heavy. So you, you, you will have a lot of troubles, you know, or you will spend a lot of money uh, getting a good uh, equatorial mount for them. So the apochromatic refractor is a really way to go. They are very robust. They don't need to be collimated like Teutonians. Um, and yeah, this is what I would recommend. Also, what we learned is a you know how the different focal lengths of the telescope affects your field of view. So on this example, you, you can see like, for example, if you have 50 millimeter telescope, which is not really a telescope, it's like a little camera lens, you know, field of view will be really big. Uh, so you will be able to capture a lot of uh, targets, but you won't have a, you know, high resolution of uh, small targets. However, if you have a long focal lens, you can uh, really zoom into your uh, target and, and you will see details of uh, nebulas. Um, so, you, you know, you, you, yeah, like long focal lengths, you know, for small targets, uh, small focal lengths for large targets. All, we also learned, you know, the effects of um, atmospheric distortion on, uh, on the viewing. Um, in uh, this particular case, we can see how sun is distorted by the Earth's atmosphere on the sunset. Um, and this distortion, the, the primarily uh, the biggest factor is caused by the uh, Earth's atmosphere. Um, and uh, we learned how, you know, having a big telescope is not always uh, gives you a much better advantage over smaller telescopes, primarily because of this atmospheric distortion. Um, and this, uh, this distortion is also caused locally, not only by uh, Earth's atmosphere, but it can also be caused by the fact that your telescope can be hotter or warmer than your uh, ambient air around the telescope. And in this case, uh, your telescope will also produce some turbulent airflow. Um, and you want to make sure that your telescope is cooled down before you use it for any imaging or viewing of the planets. That's why they uh, very often install little fans uh, to cool down the main mirror on the telescopes. Uh, it can also be caused locally by a wind. For example, if you stand behind the hill and it's a windy day uh, and you're standing on the uh, downwind side of the hill, you will have a, this, you know, a turbulent air. So you want to stand actually on the upwind side of the hill. Um, but this is all for planetary. You know, when you want to see like really small things like planets, um, stars, etc. If you want to see big things like Milky Way and nebulas, nebulas are actually much, much larger than planets. Uh, most people actually have this uh, a bit confused. They think that nebulas are really hard to see because they are small. Uh, actually, they are much bigger than planets. You know, like here, you can see this red nebula and the planet would be a size of a star. So uh, just for a comparison, the nebulas are much, much bigger. However, for nebulas, the, the most uh, sensitive thing is uh, light pollution. You cannot afford any light pollution at all uh, if you want to see nebulas. Uh, so for planets, it's uh, atmospheric distortion, and turbulent air. For dark sky objects like nebulas and galaxies, it's all about light pollution. 
Uh, and you know the, the conclusion of the talk was that uh, a Dobsonian is a most versatile tool, and I was really recommending getting a Dobsonian as your first telescope. This is much much more about the astrophotography. So say you already you know know that you want to do astrophotography, uh, you will learn quite a lot. There's quite a lot of topics. I will be just introducing you to all these topics. I won't go into details. You can actually record like a 20 minute video about each of these topics. Uh, so if you want to learn more, please, you know, I will share the slides as last time. Just, just go here. Uh, there's very nice YouTube channels. Uh, there are very nice forums. Uh, there are, I also shared a few websites. This is uh, like an Instagram for astrophotography. Um, and there are also shared websites for buying stuff. Say you want to get used stuff, eBay, Craigslist, Facebook, it's a classical place, but there is also a dedicated eBay for astrophotographers. It's called Astromark. So check it out as well. Uh, and for new websites, is the websites I used uh, the most, you know, best prices, etc. But also be aware that there's, there's quite a lot of stuff, uh, uh, quite a lot of misinformation on the forums, particularly, uh, you know, Quite a lot of people uh, are really confident about things they have, they know nothing about. So uh, kind of double check uh, uh, everything that you read. Also, there can be misinformation in my slides. So, uh, you know, it's pretty sure uh, there can be, you know, people who are uh, more confident in the, the, the stuff. And if you see mistakes, please correct me. Uh, I don't want to transfer misleading knowledge uh, forward. Uh, so yeah, um, so we already said about focal lengths, you know, small focal lengths for wide targets. So it's kind of like reverse. The if you want to get a big field of view, get a small focal lengths. If you want to get a large, a small field of view, like if you want to zoom, zoom in, magnify, get the long focal lengths. And you would say, okay, uh, you know, I want to see uh, spiral galaxies, which are typically very small. I will just get a 700 millimeter telescope. Uh, the problem is uh, with very high magnifications, if you ever try to shoot like with a camera with a like telephoto lens, you probably notice that you are really sensitive to vibrations. Your image like really shakes. So if you ever use the binoculars, you know, if your arms sh are shaking, your image will shake. Uh, same with shooting. So with high magnification, you're really sensitive to any kind of vibrations. Uh, you will be also sensitive to any tracking. Uh, we will talk more about this later, uh, tracking errors. Uh, so I would really recommend as a beginner to really stick below 400 millimeters and ideally below two or 300 millimeters. I would say between you know, 100 and 250 is a uh, golden focal uh, length. Uh, it, that's a lesson. And you know, a comparison different focal lengths. Um, you really don't need something long to get a beautiful photos. For example, this photo is taken with eight millimeter uh, lens. So, yeah. Um, you know, basics of how to, of general photography: the exposure triangle. Anyone who did the photography is familiar with this stuff. Basically. Um, if you have a fully manual camera, like a camera where you can have full manual control, you will be able to, co to control three main things. Uh, first thing is the uh, aperture. Um, sometimes it's fixed. For example, if you get the um, astrophotography telescope, uh, typically your aperture is fixed to the largest aperture you can have. Um, and here it's a bit uh, mis you know, confusing because the largest aperture is actually the smallest focal ratio number. Um, so for us, is he frozen for everyone? Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> hey guys, where did they drop? You were talking about aperture and how sometimes it's fixed at its biggest um, possible aperture. Okay, I am sorry for this. Um, I will... 
Okay. Can we see again the screen? Yep. I can see some. Not okay. Good. Um, so you know, you want the big aperture because the big aperture allows you to collect as much light as possible. However, the big aperture will also uh, bring you. It will reveal all kind of optical imperfections uh, that your lens or telescope has. Uh, so if you close down the aperture, you can really minimize some coma, uh, chromatic, spherical aberrations. If you have a, your aperture wide open, all these aberrations will reveal themselves. That's why uh, a big aperture telescopes are expensive uh, because they have to work hard to correct for all kinds of uh, aberrations. Another thing you can control is the shutter speed. So uh, as you can see here, if you have a slow shutter speed, one eighth of a second, you know, like say at one second, you see the guy is blurred, he's running very fast. And uh, uh, yeah, that's a downside of a, a, a slow uh, shutter speed. However, if you open your you know, shutter for a long time, what it allows you is to allow you to collect more light, right? I mean, if you open it for 10 seconds and one second, obviously you're getting much more light when you open it for 10 seconds. However, you know, your image can get blurred if your telescope vibrates uh, or if you don't track uh, your objects properly. Um, and another thing, the third thing you can also control um, is uh, the ISO. And ISO is basically amplification of a signal. So each pixel on a CMOS camera has amplifier. Um, and uh, say two photons hit the you know the pixel, uh, your amplifier can you know uh, increase the signal. However, if you amplify too much, you will also have a noise. Uh, so you you know you can't just put ISO hundred thousand and say okay this is my astrophotography kit now. I don't need big aperture telescope. I don't need a long shutter, uh, long exposure time. No, you will get a lot of noise. Um, so the, the focal ratio. Um, another thing about the focal ratio, as I said, you know, the big focal ratio, you collect more light, smaller, you collect less light. Oh, and another big thing um, about the focal ratios is that when you have a small F number, you will have a very small tolerances very tight tolerance to focusing. You see here, your aperture is bigger. The, the, the focal, um, the you know, distance where you're, you will be in focus, um, so this is your camera sensor, is very, very small. If you move your, you know, if you move your focus, uh, so your camera closer or further than this distance, you will be blurred, you will have blurred image. Uh, that's why, you know, uh, small focal ratio lenses are preferred for portraits photography because as you can see the background is blurred so there's you know much more accent on the object itself uh, with a small aperture a uh, big focal ratio you are much more forgiven for any uh, focus imperfections as you can see here uh, the you know f-stop is bigger than here and the um, background is less blurred however um, interesting thing is for same focal number, but different uh, focal lenses, you will also experience this effect. So um, if your focal length is big, so if your focal length is long, like three or 500 millimeters, you will also have very tight uh, distance uh, where your image can be focused. Uh, compared to more wide angle lens. This is another reason why I suggest for beginners to stick with a shorter focal length telescopes because focusing will be much easier. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, we, we already talked about the, the exposure time. You know, if you want, don't want your image to be blurred, uh, have a short exposure time. Um, and you know the, the immediate question is uh, how fast or how slow can how long can I uh, take a photo of a night sky without my stars being trailed? As you can see over here, uh, you have like 90 seconds exposure, and you see the stars are like prolonged. It's called the star trails. 
it is because the earth rotates uh, and if you don't track the rotation you know of the earth and the movement of the stars you will get the star trails well to get the, the image like this you see 30 seconds you don't have star trails so how do you know the the optimal time is you use the 500 rule uh, this is the first most important lesson in this uh, workshop the 500 rule um, remember this equation uh, the optimal exposure time is 500 divided by focal lengths and a crop factor. What is a crop factor? Um, basically, your um, camera sensors have different size. Uh, the, um, uh, the most historical, like popular uh, size is a full frame uh, and it's a crop factor of one. However, if your sensor is smaller than the full frame, uh, then your crop factor will be bigger. So for most, just also remember this number for most uh, DSLRs, consumer DSLRs, you have crop factor 1.5. Uh, so it's 500 divided 1.5 multiplied by focal length. So say we have a, a 250 uh, millimeter telescope, uh, then what you will have is 500 divided by 1.5 divided by 250, you will have only one second exposure time, right? Uh, However, if you have, say, a 10 millimeter lens, 500 divided by 10 divided by 1.5, you will have 30 seconds of exposure time. So you can see how just having a short focal length lens allows you to have much longer exposure time without having to have any type of equatorial mounts, right? Um, another thing you can play, uh, you know, as we said, you can increase the ISO to um, amplify signal to try to reduce your required exposure time to, uh, you know, to gain enough light. Uh, the problem is if you amplify too much, you'll get too much noise. Uh, so uh, most typical consumer cameras, the recommended ISO, I would say is about 1600. Uh, some of them can go up to 6400. Uh, but usually when you go above 6400, there is a noise that appears that cannot be corrected even with the stacking. Uh, so try to keep your ISO below 6400 or ideally uh, 1600 or smaller. Um, and uh, you know you would say, um, is, it, is there a way possible you know to get uh, more uh, exposure time? Yes, if you use the equatorial mount. So as we said before in the class workshop, the equatorial mount basically tracks the rotation of the Earth. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are like expensive equatorial mounts. This is uh, $1,000. You, however, can get also uh, a portable and uh, cheaper equatorial mounts. This one is a $400. There's also equatorial mounts at $100, uh, but they are very lightweight. They cannot support much weight. So do your research about the equatorial mounts. Uh, this is how you can do exposure times of five minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, so this mount, I wouldn't recommend more than five minutes exposure. On this mount, you can do 20 minutes and more. Uh, yeah, so, you know, you would say, okay, great, I get an equatorial mount, so why don't I just do one hour exposure time? Well, the problem is your, you also have a limitation there. If you do too long exposure time, your sensor it starts to overheat. And you see on these images, there's like a purple haze on the left corner. These are photos I took myself uh, of the Andromeda Galaxy and Pleiades. You see this purple haze? This will stay here permanently and it won't be corrected by stacking. Um, so this is really bad. You don't want your sensor to overheat. And this is only uh, five minute exposure time. So my camera, a Fuji X-T20 is not really perfect astrophotography camera as it is uh, because the sensor starts to overheat only after five minutes. Uh, and people actually come with a very crazy ideas uh, how to solve this problem. Some of them put their cameras in the ice baths. Uh, some actually attach a Peltier, you know, uh, cooling system directly to their sensors. Some just drill holes in their cameras and attach a fan. Uh, so you can find, you know, more about solving this uh, sensor overheating issues on the internet. And professional astrophotography cameras actually have Peltier uh, T coolers attached to the sensors. Um, so yeah, like with a, with a normal unmodified camera, 
uh, five minutes is a is a maximum uh, you can get away with typically, uh, even with perfect tracking. Um, and you would say, hey, um, you know, I have a my typical DSLR. I have a quatorial mount. Uh, I'm limited to five minutes maximum exposure time. My telescope is not that wide. I can can collect only that much light, and I'm limited to 600 ISO. Am I stuck? Can I ca like? Is it all I can do? Uh, is it not possible for me to image very dim objects now? Uh, well, there is a solution, and it's called image stacking. And uh, that's the second thing. And uh, probably the last most important thing you need to learn from this workshop, image stacking. So what do you do is you take a lot of uh, dark photos, you know, like you, you can say underexposed photos. You can see there are quite a lot of details missing. And you can take a lot of them. Some people take like hundreds of them. And then you stack them on top of each other to reveal the image like this. So you see, and it's actually true, these are actually photos from the almost exactly one year ago. Uh, this is the image uh, I took on Stahar uh, field trip uh, of the Orion Nebula through Stahar telescope. And you can see there are a lot of details missing. This was already enough to, you know, uh, get everyone into uh, very excited. Uh, however, when I went home and I started post-processing, uh, I got even more excited because I saw the power of stacking. I got from 20 of those underexposed images, one of these. It's, it's really incredible how much uh, this stacking, you know, allows you to do. Um, so, um, you know, the way the stacking works is you take a lot of um, what I call the image, uh, the light data, However, you also, if you want to get the perfect stacking results, you also need to take what are called darks, flats, and bias frames. You can, there are plenty of videos on YouTube and articles online, read more about them later. Uh, the only thing I would say is I recommend two softwares for this. The first one is Sequator, extremely easy to use, um, very, very simple. It's one button operation. Uh, the second one is Deep Sky Stacker, uh, much more popular. A lot of uh, tutorials on YouTube about this software. A bit more advanced, but still very easy to use. Both are free. Uh, if you are a really insane person, uh, you can pay $400 for PixInsight. Uh, very advanced software um, and really, really good. Most of the photos on Astrobin, the astrophotography Instagram you will see, they actually process with the PixInsight. So the, what stacking allows you to do, it allows you to remove the noise uh, and allows you to increase the exposure time. Now the question for everyone, there are two photos that I took. Uh, which one is better for the long term and why? I actually want someone to answer it. Jackson, I think you know the answer, come on. I think, I think I would go with the one on the left because the one on the right seems kind of noisy and you can see some of those purple artifacts on the side um, at the edge of the images that you were saying is caused by overheating. Exactly, yeah. So if you take the photo on the left and you stack like say 20 of them, you will be able to see, okay, so uh, to see a lot, of, a lot more details. So you see the photo on the right, even though you can see many more details, like you can see these clouds around the Pleiades stars um, there are noises, as Jackson just noted, that cannot be removed by stacking. If I stack 20 of those photos, this purple, this purple, that purple, it will stay and it will actually get amplified by stacking. Uh, so you actually want to keep your exposure time um, uh, slow, like, uh, not too long to avoid the overheating. Um, so now, you know, we were pretty much done with the settings, uh, basic settings of the camera. Uh, so if you already own the camera, you can pretty much go outside and start shooting uh, by knowing the, uh, you know, what to look out for. Uh, however, if you don't have anything and you just started, uh, just starting with the hobby, um, you know, what to get first. Obviously, the first thing you need is a camera. You can do photography if you don't have a camera. Uh, the camera doesn't have to be digital, actually. You can have a film camera. 
uh, and you can have a very long exposure time on the films because they are not prone to uh, to thermal noises. Uh, but I, I would recommend you know digital camera for those reasons. And you can get one actually under two hundred dollars on eBay, Craigslist, Facebook, etc. The second most important thing I would recommend is uh, getting a good mount. Uh, you can get a good tripod if you make in wide field astrophotography. So for example, you, you remember 500 rule, if you have like 10 millimeter lens and you have 30 second exposure time, you can get away without uh, uh, equatorial mount. Uh, however, if you want to, you know, be 100 millimeters and longer, uh, there your exposure time will be limited by three seconds without equatorial mount. I would recommend you investing or even making your own equatorial mount. And the cheapest equatorial mount that is suitable for astrophotography is uh, about $300. Uh, uh, and, you know, the third uh, most important thing is obviously a lens. Um, it doesn't have to be a telescope. You can find plenty of vintage lenses on eBay, Craigslist, uh, they are called what's M44, uh, M42 lenses, uh, and they typically run below $50. Uh, prime lenses, not vintage, but uh, you know, like 50 millimeter f1.8 is something I would recommend personally, because they have a much better image quality than vintage lenses, uh, and they're still quite cheap. Uh, and you know, it doesn't matter which focal length. You can shoot with whatever. If you already got a camera, if you already got a lens, just use it. You don't have to buy anything else. Uh, just choose your target carefully. If you have 35 millimeter lens, you can shoot, you know, something like this. 135, you can, uh, you know, take photos like those. There is a tar target for local lens. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's a lesson. Another lesson, if you don't have a quartorial mount, keep yourself below 50 millimeters. If you don't have really expensive equatorial mount, keep yourself below 400 millimeters. Once you go above 400 millimeter focal lengths, you need some really expensive equatorial mount, which are $1,500 and more. Uh, there are some links uh, on DIY, uh, you know, how to make your own equatorial mount. Go out and check it out. Um, well, you, you remember I said that vintage lenses and the prime lenses, why I recommend prime lenses? Well, here is the reason. Uh, most vintage lenses suffer from spherical aberrations uh, quite badly. They, have, they will suffer from coma in the corners. Um, modern lenses, uh, you know, technology improved a lot how to make a sphere lenses. Um, so, yeah. I hope no more explanation needed here. You know, um, modern technology better than old technology. However, if you're on a budget, you know, having something is better than having nothing. Uh, so you can start from cheap, uh, uh, cheap vintage lenses, and then you can progress slowly if you find it's you know something you like. Um, another thing, and it's uh, probably the biggest lesson I learned, and it's a lesson everybody will learn hard way. Uh, sooner or later, as a beginner, you are really, really tempted to go and get a long focal length uh, telescope. Big mistake. Uh, and I, I don't think people will learn this until they actually do this mistake. Uh, so I got myself this 500 millimeter, you know, vintage lens from eBay, and I tried to make a photo of the, the Neowise comet. Uh, and somebody else tried to take photo of an LS comet. We had quite similar, um, can I get rid of this thing? Uh, anyway, we had a quite similar budget lenses. His lens was $450 minus $300. So you see how optical quality of his modern lens is much more important uh, than the long focal lengths of my telescope. And actually, the Neowise comment is a target that is captured much better with a shorter focal length optics. And you need a sharp optics to see all these details. Uh, so if you are on a budget, get something sharp and not as magnifying, rather than getting something magnifying and not sharp. Uh, 
and you know there is a, a list of a gear that I would recommend. Um, it's just my own opinion uh, from things I used myself, from things I read, like countless articles online. I would really, as for the camera, if you don't have anything, I would really recommend Canon. If you have a camera, use what you've got. There are adapters for all uh, bayonets, for all camera types. If you're just starting, why I recommend Canon is because there are plenty more adapters for Canon. For, I mean, as sad as it is, I'm an icon Fuji guy, but there are just Canons are so much more popular, uh, so much more stuff for Canon. Uh, I would recommend this way. Uh, the mount, you know, I would really like use a tripod or uh, go for the uh, uh, or go for the uh, DIY uh, equatorial mount. There, uh, I said that you know a good equatorial mount. Useful for astrophotography runs at three fifty dollars, which is Skywatch or Sky Star Adventure Pro. There is also another interesting thing: the Omega Mini. Uh, it's only one fifty dollars. You can also find it cheaper on used market. However, it can support only small rigs. You won't be able to attach a big telescope, uh, you know, or even like a moderately sized telephoto lens. I would recommend this mount only for wide angle, like Milky Way kind of astrophotography. But it's a good way, you know, to increase your exposure time from 30 seconds to say uh, two minutes. It's very lightweight, it's very cheap. Uh, something, you know, to think about. Uh, and for lenses, you know, if you're just starting get a vintage lens, something very cheap, you can get one for 10 bucks on Craigslist. Uh, however, you know, if you, if you got a job, uh, you know, you, you have some money, uh, you want to spend you know, get something that will just work uh, and work properly, I would recommend getting the red cut. There is a no better portable beginner telescope than red cut uh, for some reason. Uh, it's very expensive. However, it's very small, very lightweight, which makes it compatible with a Skywatcher, uh, very cheap, uh, you know, uh, equatorial mount. Um, and you can attach any camera you want to it. You can attach any filter you want to it. Um, there is another option, a bit cheaper, uh, which is a sub, it's a Chinese company, Samyang Rokinon, uh, 135 millimeter F2. It's really impressive. The, the red cat, I think it's F4, and it's 250 millimeter focal length. This is, even though, you know, it's a twice uh, smaller focal length, so it will be, have a wider field of view, it's F2, extremely fast. You can, you know, instead of having like a five minutes exposure time on Red Cat, you will have a one minute exposure time using Rokinon. Um, the big disadvantage, and I'm still looking for solution, is that you cannot attach uh, light pollution filters easily to this mount, uh, to this telescope, sorry. To this lens, actually, it's not even a telescope. Uh, and there are plenty more, uh, you know, Mm, uh, choices. Uh, you can also get like a used, uh, good used telephoto lens, uh, Canon, Nikon, uh, most popular ones on the used market for $200 to $500. Uh, they will all, however, you know, have the same disadvantage as uh, this option that you can't easily attach uh, a filter to it. And I will explain why later. And the option I went with, and I wouldn't recommend because I'm suffering now, is uh, getting something like a, uh, you know, we can call it a proper astrophotography telescope. Uh, the thing is, they are actually quite heavy. Uh, they start to be quite heavy. And this mount, in my experience, just really struggles uh, to support the weight. Uh, and also the focal length of uh, my telescope, of this telescope, is uh, 480 millimeters of 400 something millimeters. And uh, it's just too much focal length for this mount. Uh, you need the uh, active guiding. Um, so uh, yeah, I would recommend keeping with those options about. Uh, and uh, one thing I, you know, really emphasize is don't forget about the wide angle astrophotography. And in my opinion, it's much more fun than the you know, the, uh, the like taking photos of nebulas. It doesn't bring that wow effect. Uh, 
to like your friends. Uh, but personally, I find it much more interesting to, it's, it's more like an art rather than engineering science problem. Uh, and, you know, 500 rules is playing to your advantage. You don't need a quartorial mount to take photos like this. And this photo, I think, is taken by Serena and Jackson. Um, and, and Donna. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. don't know, yeah. is anyone else in there? Um, I think it was, it was the three of us and then our other roommate um, who were there. That was in Great Basin National Park in Nevada. But, yeah, all I used was, like, my Nikon... D3300 and a tripod that's older than I am. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I mean, yeah, it just, you know, shows you that you can get a, a kit that will be enough to take photo like this for $200 on eBay. Uh, you know, you don't need anything super special for wide angle astrophotography. Uh, what is going to change results and, you know, to get really spectacular wide angle astrophotography photos, don't forget about stacking. This is the biggest difference between amazing and beautiful, uh, you know, Milky Way shots that you can find on the internet versus, um, you know, some more like amateur kind of looking. It's all about stacking. Um, however, stacking, you know, reduces the fun because now you need to take 20 photos and process them later. Uh, but stacking is a key here. Um, and yeah, like this is the kind of gear I would recommend for wide angle uh, astrophotography. The, the, the interesting thing here is th these lenses, especially this one, the Canon 50 millimeter F1.8 is really cheap. You can get one for $50 used. Um, uh, and the, the Canon Nikon DSLR, so you can get for $100. And interesting thing about, you know, buying a DSLR, uh, try to find something with a broken autofocus. So the way DSLRs uh, autofocus, they have a prism and then they have a separate sensor for the prism. Sometimes those prisms get misaligned or the sensors get broken for the autofocus. And a lot of people think they are broken because they cannot you know, focus. However, when you do the uh, astrophotography, you focus it manually. Anyway, you don't use autofocus for it. Um, so it's a perfect opportunity to get something very cheap. Uh, yeah, and it's a, yeah, wide angle, much cheaper, uh, more artistic, uh, I think more interesting. Uh, and you, you can also do astrophotography with your phone. And all these photos I, I have taken with my phone. Uh, here's my girlfriend, uh, Sholpan, taking, you know, photos from a phone and I'm taking photo of her from my phone. And you can even see a Milky Way in the background. Uh, however, you will need a, a really good phone for this. Uh, you like, you know, something like Galaxy S10, Google Pixel 4, uh, even iPhones, the iPhone 10s, uh, Pros, they are not that great for uh, astrophotography. Uh, and the key thing you want is you want to have a manual mode so you can set your exposure time manually. Uh, the reason why is if you set your exposure time too long, and these are photos taken by Jackson, by the way, uh, if you set your exposure time too long, you will have star trails. Right, so you see, it's all taken with the phone, by the way. If you have your ISO too much, you will see noise that cannot be corrected with stacking. Uh, if you have exposure time too low, you won't see enough details. Um, and I think this is a, oh, I think this is a dusk. This is probably like a sunset or something like that. Um, so you actually want to have something like this, maybe a bit more signal, a bit more exposure time. Uh, maybe put it on a equatorial mount. Um, and then you just stack it. You stack it, stack it, stack it, and details will reveal itself. The problem is if your exposure time is too small, so I think this is too small exposure time. Even if you stack a lot of images, if the signal is hidden behind the background noise of the sensor, uh, you won't reveal the signal by stacking. So there is this, like a kind of threshold, a minimum exposure time that you want to have before you can, you know, you, you actually collect enough signal uh, for the astrophotography. And at Stahar, we have like two main telescopes, at least that are not broken and can be readily used. The one in the, um, in the observatory, uh, Michael Loomis Observatory, I forgot the name. 
uh, you know, the huge refractor that we have uh, that we do trainings on, you can do astrophotography on it. But as you can see, it suffers from all kinds of aberrations. It's a, it's a beautiful tool. Unfortunately, it's not very sharp. It's just, it's just old. Uh, this is an image uh, taken with the SCT, uh, the Celestron 8-inch SCT. Uh, see, much sharper image. Um, still a bit of blurriness because I think we didn't uh, focus it properly. Because this is my first ever deep sky object photo taken. So I didn't know what I'm doing. And still then I managed to get this. So uh, I hope you will get something you know much better than this after this tutorial. Um, and uh, yeah, light pollution, the biggest enemy of deep sky objects astrophotography. Um, how do you deal with it? Well, there are two main ways, I think. One is uh, to get in one of those dark regions, uh, you know, maybe not uh, set far, you can actually drive, but, you know, just find the local dark spot uh, next to you. Um, what I did once is because my equatorial mount and all my gear is kind of lightweight. Uh, I was actually purchasing it with this, uh, with this aim uh, to be able to carry it around. We actually climbed uh, uh, Mount Liberty and we stayed there overnight trying to take the photo of, uh, uh, of the Neowise comet, of the Andromeda galaxy. And you can see the, the Big problem here are the clouds. Unfortunately, the clouds stayed all night and I didn't manage to take anything. It was still beautiful. Um, uh, but yeah, you can, you know, you can either climb somewhere far and high so you don't have uh, light pollution or you can buy a light pollution filter. Uh, and you can see the example here. See this, there's like an orange haze, a glow, which is actually the light pollution from the city. And until recently, the biggest source of light pollution from the city uh, were uh, sodium vapor lamps. And the beauty about sodium vapor lamps, they were monochrome radiation, one single wavelength, 600 and something nanometers. You filter it out, you filter entire light pollution from the city. The problem is now the cities have these fancy LEDs, which are broadband, and it's uh, just impossible to filter it without also removing the no signal from your object that you want to image. Um, so, you know, having these dramatic effects is much harder nowadays, uh, at least next to the modern cities. Uh, so that's a big disadvantage of LEDs, even though people think that because they're more efficient, well, yeah. Uh, and if you stack this image enough, you will get the, you know, the final photo like this, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, so uh, light pollution filters have, you know, limited application nowadays. They still do their work, but not as efficiently as they used to do. Uh, and another thing is try to choose your object that is not located above cities, but it's located above dark sites. So if you travel to a dark site, travel by planning which object you will be shooting. Uh, and, you know, we talk about LEDs, there is also a next generation, uh, you know, problem are coming. Uh, it's not only Elon Musk who is doing this, although he is the main blame nowadays. There are also, you know, the uh, Jeff Bezos is uh, doing some stuff, planning. I think this will be a big, uh, big source of uh, debate and the uh, all kind of regulations in the future. Uh, the artificial satellites, you heard about Starlink, right? They want to launch, I don't know, 20,000 satellites. It's crazy. Uh, the thing is about those satellites, they have really big solar panels, which are actually very reflective. Um, so you actually see them as a bright stars moving around. And you can see someone's, you know, beautiful photo of a uh, Neowise comet got ruined. Uh, and there are plenty of examples online. Um, um, yeah, there are uh, sources or tools. I shared links here. Uh, check it out later. Um, before you go to do some imaging, plan your trip. 
So yesterday I did all the planning. I checked the weather, weather was more or less good. Um, you know, I found the dark side, uh, just went to uh, Hollywood Point State Park. However, I, I forgot my memory stick. So um, yeah, make sure you got all your gear, including memory sticks, which are very easy to forget. And uh, use the Latin for planning. Uh, and I actually want to spend quite a bit of time here. I hope you can all see uh, me playing out with Stellarium. It's an extremely beautiful tool. Download it, um, and you don't even need to travel to the you know, dark spots. You don't even need to go outside. You just zoom in, and you see all kind of stuff here. It's amazing. Uh, once you download it, there are quite a few things. Uh, you know, there are plenty of videos on YouTube how to use it, but let me briefly first, very quick crash course. There are no buttons here. They are actually hidden on the left corner. So if you click on these arrows, you will be able to fix, fixate these buttons in a place. Um, you see that the Milky Way is kind of uh, dim. You can actually go into this setting and increase the brightness of the Milky Way. Let's put it three. Uh, much brighter now. And say I want to image a deep sky objects. You don't see any labels of deep sky objects now. There is a button here, deep sky objects. You press it, and now all the deep sky objects are labeled, right? Uh, you see there are very few labels. The reason why is because they're filtered. So if you go to settings, deep sky objects, there is a filter limited by magnitude. So uh, you know the deep sky objects, they have different brightness. Something like Orion Nebula is really bright. Uh, something like elephant's trunk nebula is kind of dim, um, so you can you know you can do all all kind of stuff. But say you, you know you, I want to take a photo of Orion nebula, I go into and opa, it's behind the horizon. So I want to find out when will it get above the horizon. So what I can do is I can control time here, and I'll say oh around twelve, the Orion will be above the horizon. However, there is a problem. Around 12, the moon will also be above the horizon and it will introduce the light pollution. So let's find a time when the moon won't be above horizon, but the Orion will be above horizon, uh, 11.53. So you have a time somewhere between you know, 11 and 12 uh, when Orion will be far above the horizon, but without the moon. Uh, now, um, you want to you know, see how will it look on your final photo. So you can go into settings here and you can put all kind of stuff. You can put your sensor uh, dimensions. So you see, I have pre-programmed my cameras that I have, the Fuji, uh, etc. So say I choose a Fuji, right? You can also pre-program uh, the telescopes here. So I have uh, my uh, William Optics Zenith Star 73 here with a focal length of 430, a diameter, et cetera, et cetera. So what you can do is you can press this button now. And uh, that's how Orion will look on the final photo. And you see now here, you can really compare and you can really see a benefit of uh, 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 of a long focal, uh, short focal length, wide field of your telescopes. So for example, say I want to use this, um, uh, the SCT that uh, Stafford has, you know, the, the one I, I took the, used to take the first, my ever first uh, deep sky object photo. You see how really magnified you are to this uh, nebula? You actually lose quite a lot of details around it. Uh, this is the William Optics Telescope I have. However, if you have, you know, this uh, Rockin on 135 millimeter, you see that you can actually take very interesting photos as well. You can actually take a photo where your Orion will be visible. Uh, I don't know the other nebulous names, but there's like a Casper and Friendly Ghost Nebula. Uh, there are some bright stars. So, you know, there are objects for all kinds of focal lengths. So use Stellarium, it's a beautiful tool. Um, and you, you, it's, it's not only about the cameras, you can also imitate the view from the eyepieces. Uh, yeah, that's all about Stellarium. Uh, now troubleshooting. You know, um, you, at some point, well, probably the very first time you start doing this, you'll run into troubles. 
uh, first travel, the most popular is just blurry image. And there is a, you know, step by step, I recommend just downloading the slide or taking a photo and, you know, it will be like a field guide. Blurred image, first thing, probably bad focus. If your focus is sharp uh, and you know it's good by using Bakhtin of mass, we'll cover this later. Most likely, if you're using the uh, Newtonian, you have a problem with collimations. This, I know it's a Newtonian. And actually, uh, when Jackson sent me this photo, I was like, Jackson, you probably have a Newtonian and you most likely have a bad collimation. The way I knew it's Newtonian, you see these crosses? They're like a uh, like cross uh, kind of, uh, this is caused by the uh, 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 diffraction from the way that secondary mirror is held. Uh, it's very interesting, actually. We'll go back. You see the Newtonian? There is a secondary mirror, and there are actually these uh, leaves this, that hold the secondary mirror. And these crosses are actually caused by them. So a lot of people love them because they look very much like photos taken by Hubble telescope, it's because the Hubble telescope has exactly the same way of holding the secondary mirror. Um, but there are a few people who actually hate this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, something to be aware of. Uh, if your collimation is uh, good or you don't have a Newtonian, you have a refractor, you don't have to care about collimation, uh, probably, you know, it's a polar alignment, and then there are like ways to solve it. You can reduce aperture if you're using camera lens. If you're using telescope, unfortunately, you cannot do it. But if you are using, like, a, say, a Canon 50 millimeter lens, and you see your image is blurred, but you know your focus is like on point, you know you're polar aligned, reduce your aperture. And actually, with a lot of um, lenses out there, consumer lenses, you want to reduce your aperture. If your lens is 1.8, reduces at least 2.2 or 2.4. If your lens is 3.5, reduce it to 4 f4. Um, this is you know the best uh, way to solve your sharpness problem. Uh, however, as we said, you know you, your exposure time will increase, so uh, you you have to find like a golden uh, middle ground. Um, and another, if uh, your mount shakes too much, if there are too many vibrations, you have to reduce your exposure time. Um, Probably blurness is caused by, you know, it's vibrating and you just get an averaged position of your objects. Uh, another problem, very common problem, are the star trails. Uh, and the star trails is, as we said, is caused by the, you know, Earth rotating, so the stars move. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, biggest source is a polar alignment. If you are not using the uh, equatorial mount, you have too long exposure time, so reduce your exposure time. If you use an equatorial mount, double check that you are polar aligned. Um, another problem that can be caused by star trails is that your guiding, the, your, your, your equatorial mount is not guiding properly. It's probably moving too slow or too fast. And actually with the Skywatcher uh, Star Adventure mount I have, if your battery is still running low, it will actually be guiding slower because uh, it doesn't have enough power. Uh, so for this, you can actually use, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 I will talk about this later, the uh, active guiding. Um, if you don't want to use active guiding, just reduce your exposure time. And uh, another thing, what can look as a star trails can actually be a comma. And the way you can differentiate between comma and the star trails, star trails will have a same direction along the whole frame. Comma will actually have trails going out of the center to the corners. So if it's a comma, you have to correct your collimation. Um, and uh, yeah, you can uh, you know choose the equatorial mount. And the, the crash course here is that there are two main types of equatorial mounts. There are dump equatorial mounts that just have a uh, all the kind of down motorized equatorial mounts uh, that have a motor that uh, pre-programmed to rotate with the same earth, the same speed that the earth rotates. And there are also smart called go-to equatorial mounts that actually have these remote controls that you can see here. And once you align your mount with the polar star and you put GPS coordinates inside of this mount, uh, and once you do a one star or two, three star alignment, so once this mount knows where it is, 
in a, you know, relative to the sky, you can just type in the target you want and it will slew automatically to the target. And this is kind of cheating, uh, but it will save you a lot of time. But at the same time, it's not as interesting as finding targets yourself and they are kind of expensive. So this mount is uh, the mount I want to get. It's like a dream mount, it's $2,000. Uh, but it's beautiful, you can see it's like, you know, as centrally balanced and blah, blah, blah. Like you can spend days and days reading about them. Uh, so uh, yeah, do your research when choosing a quarter mount. And this is the, the, the compact uh, Omegon mount I was talking about. As you see, nobody uses them with the long focal length uh, lenses. And uh, yeah, so now we pretty much covered all of the uh, basic stuff. And this is uh, going to uh, much more advanced things. So pretty much up to here, you should be able to go outside and uh, uh, do your photos. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, stick uh, for hopefully 15 more minutes. Um, sorry for taking a uh, time of the uh, dinner time, but uh, I hope this will be you know interesting for experienced astrophotographers, uh, such as uh, uh, Jackson, Seren, and Anna, Anna already are. And this is where they can learn uh, uh, a bit of more stuff. So first thing I would recommend, uh, you know, once you got your camera lens and mount, is to get something to control your camera. The problem is, uh, you know, your, your, your built-in camera controls are kind of limited. Uh, and sometimes you want to have five minute exposure, right? Uh, most cameras, they allow you to have only 30 seconds or one minute exposure time. Uh, above this, you have to do some tricks. So some cameras have a built-in time-lapse settings. And I know that Nikon uh, actually has a, a built, almost all Nikons have built-in time-lapse uh, mode in the menu. And in the time-lapse mode, what you can do is you can set how many photos you want to take uh, and what is going to be the interval between each photo. And the length of each photo is set uh, manually uh, as you typically do. Uh, you know, you put it in manual mode, you set 30, 30 seconds, etc. You are still limited to 30 second exposure time, right? How can you do five minutes on a typical DSLR? Well, the, the, the easiest way is to get one of those remotes. Uh, they are like typically, you know, 50 bucks uh, on Amazon. You can get a much more simpler version not wireless, but wired. I would recommend wireless because this way you don't transfer any vibrations to the mount. Uh, and it's, you know, it's much easier to use, uh, but you can get one for $10. And in this one, you can pre-program the exposure time. So you put your camera, what is called a bulb mode. So this is the mode where as long as you keep pressing the trigger, the shutter button, you, your, your shutter will keep open and you will acquire the signal. So if you put it in a bulb time, you can do like 10, 20, 30 minutes until your camera fries because it overheats. Um, so uh, it, it also allows you to choose how many photos you want to take and it allows you to, to choose the uh, pose between each photo. And why having a, a pose like a, a, you know, for camera between each photo is important is because you want your sensor to cool down because it just you know did a five minute exposure it's really hot give it at least five to ten seconds to cool down before you take a next shot uh, and it will dramatically reduce overall uh, thermal noise uh, of your camera there is a much more advanced way to control your camera uh, i would say much less fun as well because now when you do astrophotography, you have to carry your laptop as well with you, which is connect your camera to your laptop um, and download the software to control the export. And the best software I found is a Nina. Uh, it can control Nikon and Canon, um, probably also Sony. I don't exactly sure. Uh, and it can, can control all kind of professional astrophotography cameras. Um, and you know it allows you to do much, much more stuff than this remote. Uh, and the cable, and you know everyone has a mini USB cable, so it's kind of a free option, uh, but it's less fun. Uh, 
Another thing I would recommend to purchase if you have a Newtonian is getting a, you know, a column, co good collimator. If you get a cheap collimator, you'll have a problem that the collimator is not collimator, uh, which is a nonsense. Uh, Samson Jackson is facing now. Uh, so, you know, maybe wise uh, investing a bit more to save nerves. Um, you can still, you know, calibrate your column, cheap collimator to get a good enough collimation. I mean, using the, a bad collimator is better than having uncollimated optics at all. Uh, and here is a photo uh, that, uh, again, Jackson, Serena, and Anna took. Uh, you can see this like a chicken legs. Uh, this is astigmatism and coma uh, all together, uh, doing this uh, very beautiful uh, effect that I wouldn't be able to, to get otherwise. Uh, yeah, maybe you can use it up to your advantage sometimes as well. Uh, and, you know, yeah. Uh, how do you get a perfect focus? Well, very easy, very cheap. Make your own Bakhtinov mask. If you don't want to make your own, buy one. It's uh, 10 to $50, depends on the size of the telescope. And as we said, you know, most of the um, beginner telescopes are not big, so you, $10. Uh, and the way you use it is uh, it will actually give you a diffraction uh, image like this. And this, this is a center spike. If it's on the left, it's inside focus. If it's on the right, it's outside focus. And you just want to put it in the middle. And this is how you know uh, it's perfectly focused. And then you remove Bakhtinov mask. Don't forget to remove it. Once I did the entire imaging session, leaving my Bakhtinov mask on and uh, uh, yeah, in the result, I had all stars looking like this. Um, and there is another way to do, uh, to get a good focus is actually, again, to connect your camera to the computer and use a specialized software which analyzes the shape of the stars uh, and tells you when you are in focus. And the interesting thing about this, if you can buy like a motorized focuser, they typically start at $150 and above. Um, you can do auto focusing. And the, why autofocusing is important because during the night, say you are doing a two hour long imaging session and say you started at 9 p.m. and you go until 11 p.m. This is the time when your temperature drops the fastest because your sun sets down and temperature changes and the temperature of the telescope will change as well. So the focal length, the length of the telescope will change because it will shrink because it will cool down. So your focus will actually shift. So you won't be in focus by the time you finish your imaging session. Um, this is the problem, as we said, uh, only on the telescopes with a small uh, focal ratio number, F number. If you remember uh, here, the bigger aperture you have, the smaller F number you have, the tighter your uh, focal uh, you know, uh, depth of field is, the, the uh, depth of focus, sorry, is. Um, so this is another benefit of, you know, not going too crazy into F2, but uh, staying somewhere, you know, around F4. Again, as I said, it depends on the focal length as well. So, you know, this is an important table uh, to remember as well. So autofocus can uh, save you from this headache. Um, another thing I would recommend is the, uh, uh, the uh, learn how to do a polar alignment. When I first got my uh, uh, mount, my equatorial mount, I was doing polar alignment completely wrong. I was actually putting Polaris in the middle uh, of this cross, and that's not the way to do it. Actually, the, the your uh, your northern pole, uh, this you know center of equatorial axis is slightly offset from Polaris, and this is actually the reason why you have this uh, you know circle. And uh, I should have probably asked myself why they have this circle. And you actually put Polaris on the circle. And where do you put the Polaris on the circle? Well, it depends on the time of year, on the location, on the time of day. Uh, and uh, you know there are ways that charts to calculate this, or you can just download the, the app on your phone. And there are two apps, the Polarscope Align Pro. You don't have to have a pro version. This is for iOS. Uh, for Androids, I found this app, which works really well. Uh, and actually, I think both apps allows you to have GPS coordinates as well, which is important if you have the go-to mount. Uh, 
so like a Jackson tab. Uh, uh, there is also another, I think a much better way to do the polar alignment, which is by the electronic uh, polar finder scope. And um, uh, yeah, there is a, like a, a read more about it. The problem is that you have to buy adapters. You know, there are adapters for almost all equatorial mounts, but my Star Adventure, for example, doesn't have adapter for it. Um, even though this mount is extremely sensitive to polar alignment, and the reason why is uh, because only one axis is motorized. So what I'm talking about is you see on these telescopes, they have motorized this axis and this axis. On the uh, Star Adventure, only this axis is motorized to counteract the rotation of the Earth. This one is completely manual. So if you are not polar aligned uh, perfectly, you will have star trails. Uh, so with the, you know, with the, with the cheap mounts, such as this and this and Ioptron uh, Sky Guider Pro, you really, really have to make sure you are perfectly polar aligned because those mounts, they can kind of compensate for the bad polar alignment uh, by uh, also rotating this axis, right? Uh, so this is how you get the good polar alignment. Another thing is uh, auto guiding. So you remember I said that sometimes the mounts, they can either rotate too fast or too slow. And this is where auto guiding comes into play. And uh, when I was first started reading about auto guiding, I was really confused why is everyone talking about that you have to have a PhD to do auto guiding? And I was like, seriously, do people get a PhD on auto guiding? Actually, PhD is the name of the software uh, that uh, shows you the performance and actually does the auto guiding process on the computer. Um, so yeah, one confusing out of the confusion out of the way, but you don't even have to have your laptop to do auto guiding. Most mounts uh, have auto guiding ports, and they look like a small Ethernet jacks. Um, and all auto guiding cameras have the same port, so you just connect the cable from the camera to your mount. Uh, you know, and, and, and you have a perfect auto guiding. And the way auto guiding works is you have a guide scope, a secondary scope, and you have a, a, a guide camera, and it basically tracks, you know, it, it sees the stars, and then it chooses one star, and it tracks its location. And it tries to, to keep the star exactly where it is by controlling the uh, mount's uh, movements. So if the star slowly drifts to the side, it will tell mount, to, hey, hurry up, you are not guiding fast enough, uh, something like this. Uh, and uh, you can also, you know, do guiding through the through your laptop and with a PhD2 software, what it allows you to do is it actually allows you to see uh, errors in guiding. So the smaller the error, the better, because the sharper your image will be. Uh, so that's how you can actually analyze the quality of your guiding. And if you are really, you know, really advanced people, they, they do what is called the off-axis guiding. Uh, much harder, uh, just in my experience, uh, uh, thing to do. Uh, and the way it works is you actually don't even need a secondary scope. You just put your off-axis guider here. Uh, it collects some of the light uh, from the image, the light that won't hit the sensor because your sensor is usually rectangular, right? So your sensor will be something like this. So it will collect enough light from the area where uh, you know you don't have a sensor, and it sends this uh, light to your camera, uh, guide camera, uh, and uh, yeah, that's how you uh, do the off-axis guiding. Uh, the problem here is that you know f getting into in focus is really hard, uh, and uh, you know it's not that expensive to get into auto guiding. You need a, a, a guide scope, fifty-five bucks, and a gu guide camera, which is kind of expensive, hundred fifty dollars. Um, you know, once you got auto guiding, polar alignment, pattern of mask, collimation, and advanced camera control, only then think about getting the dedicated astrophotography camera. Um, and the reason why is actually, you know, professional astrophotography cameras, they are not that uh, different from DSLRs. Biggest difference for deep sky astrophotography, what they have, 
you see this uh, radiator on the back, they have a thermoelectric cooler uh, to cool down the sensor. And they actually cool down sensor 40 degrees, typically 40 degrees below uh, room temperature. Uh, so, you know, if it's like 10 degrees outside, say it's like a winter time, it will cool down to minus 30 degrees. Uh, and this is where you have a very small amount of thermal noise. This is what allows these cameras to go 20, 30 minutes exposure time. Uh, this is where you have to have a perfect auto guiding. You have to have a perfect out polar alignment. So this is the reason why I would recommend, and I think it's sensible to get the astrophotography camera only once you have all the previous uh, things sorted out. Uh, and personally, I think if you have a DSLR, you don't even, have, you know, there is no reason to get this uh, camera because you can get away by not having long exposure time by just stacking a lot of images together, right? Uh, and in my opinion, the only reason why I would get astrophotography camera is do what is called a narrow band imaging. And uh, I will talk next slide what it is. But first, um, there are two main types of uh, professional astrophotography cameras. There is a CMOS and CCD. Uh, there is a very little actually material uh, covers in detail what the difference is. Uh, but the main difference is the way that the, the, the image sensor technology works. In CMOS, you have amplifiers for each pixel. There's basically an amplifier under each pixel. An amplifier generates heat. And this is what generates a lot of thermal noise. The CCD, they have only one amplifier connected to all of the pixels. They have very fancy way to transfer these electrons. So these photons like uh, signal that the sensors collect uh, from each pixel, they kind of like raster it this way, raster it that way. And then all this signal travels to one single amplifier. And the beauty of it is that because it's just one amplifier, all pixels get the same amount of amplification. This amplifier is located far away from the sensor. Uh, so it generates very little heat. So you will have very little what is called the amp glow. Uh, you will hear this a lot when comparing different uh, sensors and cameras. The problem with CCD is the technology is kind of dying. Uh, they are expensive. Uh, I don't know if it's actually, it's, is it because it's slow production, but they are much more expensive. They typically run above $2,000 and higher. Uh, and the same size camera in CMOS will be about $600 and higher. Uh, yeah, and there's only one manufacturer which still makes them, which is Kodak. And I think they plan to stop manufacturing them in 2022. Uh, so I don't know what will happen in the future with the CCD technology. but. You know, I said there is only one reason why I would go for the professional camera is to do the narrow band imaging. So to understand what I'm talking about, we first have to understand what are the nebulas. What are we actually taking a photo of? And what we are taking a photo of is the electrons transitioning between the electrons bands. They are relaxing from one band to another and they emit signal in the visible radiation spectrum range corresponding to these wavelengths. So Typically, you have a lot of hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur in the, uh, you know, much more hydrogen than oxygen and very little, you know, sulfur in the uh, space. Uh, so your strongest signal will be H alpha. That's why most of the uh, dark sky uh, photos you see, they are red uh, because H alpha is the strongest source of emission. And then it goes the uh, H beta, oxygen three, and sulfur two. Uh, so the, the, the thing here to note is, uh, you see how close they, they are actually located to each other? And you see that this is a spectrum that your camera, the typical um, uh, DSLR covers. You only need these spectrums to, to get the image. Um, and here is the reason why narrow band imaging is amazing. This is, a, you know, on, on this on the right, uh, is taken uh, by a, a normal RGB camera. This is taken with a narrow band uh, setup. And same here, normal RGB camera, this is a narrow band setup. So much, much more impressive. Uh, it's called, uh, it's, you know, stuck in what is called a Hubble palette. Uh, and in typical cameras, 
what you have, you have RGB filters. So each pixel has a different light filter. So this pixel will have green, this will have blue, this will have red filter. Um, and uh, what it means is that you only have like 33% collection efficiency, right? Because basically each pixel will receive only 33% of the light uh, that is transmitted. Or you, you will say that, you know, for, for, for this, like say H alpha, only the red pixels will accept the H alpha signal, right? The blue and the green, and actually in the normal cameras, we have uh, two green pixels for one blue and one red pixel. The blue and the green will not accept the signal. So you lose, you know, 75% of your pixels for to accept the same amount of H alpha radiation. If you have monochrome camera, however, however if you completely get rid of, of this uh, 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 light filters, you will collect all the signal. The problem is you will collect all the signal at once, so you won't be able to differentiate between uh, H alpha, H beta, O3, and S2. Uh, so you need a, a narrow band filters for each uh, wavelength. And there are actually narrow band filters that cover just H beta. So you spend an hour taking photos of H beta emission. Then you take spend hour taking photos in O3, 10 minutes spending to take photos in H alpha because H alpha is much brighter. And you spend three hours taking in S2 because S2 is really, really dim. So narrow band, even though it looks impressive, it takes ridiculously long amount of time. That's why most of the setups are actually um, automated. Uh, so people just set everything up, you know, press the button and go to bed or go and have a coffee and then uh, check the results next morning. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you have a monochrome, you can also do, you know, like a, a typical RGB kind of uh, imaging of the planets. Uh, and the, uh, why, you know, would you want to do monochrome imaging of the planets? Well, as we said, you know, there is such a thing as chromatic aberration. You, I keep talking about chromatic aberration, how important it is to not have it. Well, actually, if you do narrow band imaging, you, don't even need apochromatic refractor. You don't need apochromatic telescope, right? Because you will focus your camera to each wavelength. So you won't even care about chromatic aberrations anymore. Uh, so with a narrowband imaging, you can get the cheapest refractor that still have aspheric lenses. So you don't have spherical aberrations. Uh, you can get achromatic refractors and some achromatic refractors are like $70 on Amazon. There's a company called SV Bonnie, check them out. So if you want to do, you know, narrowband imaging right away, uh, you can get $2,000, uh, you know, monochrome camera, $70 telescope, uh, $400 uh, kit of uh, filters, and then you can do a narrowband imaging. Uh, and uh, yeah, for narrowband imaging, you need to be able to change filters. And I just wanted to introduce you two main ways one is getting the filter wheel. Typically, they are motorized, so you can, uh, the whole process is automated. I personally didn't buy it because I usually travel a long way to the dark side, so I have no choice but be there. Uh, and actually, the main reason why I want to do it is I just want to enjoy you know, time in the dark spot, not necessarily for the final result, but the process itself is you know, interesting. That's why I chose this system. Uh, it's a manual way to, to change filters. I think it's very, you know, very nice and uh, very versatile. You can get adapters for all kinds of cameras, for all kinds of telescopes. Uh, so this is what I would recommend personally. But, you know, if you're into automated kind of stuff, you can do it from your backyard. Uh, there is a, uh, this option. And, you know, a, a last point is a planetary astrophotography. Uh, as I say in the first presentation, I said, you know, with a Dobsonian, you can, it's a way to go for any type of visual, but it's also a way to go for the planetary astrophotography. And the reason why is because planets are bright, so you don't have to take long exposure photos. You actually, the exposure time to make a, to record the planet is like one over 100 seconds. So you don't need the equatorial mount 
uh, and you don't need uh, uh, you know long exposure times. You are not sensitive to planet actually moving. Uh, so that's why you don't need to track the planet. And because the exposure time is so low, what you actually do is you record the video. And you remember I said that the biggest uh, source of imperfections the way you see planets uh, are the atmospheric distortions. Well, the thing is, if you record enough frames, and when you record the video, you record like 2,000, 10,000 frames, and you stack them on top of each other by using these three, and each software does a separate thing, you have to use them all together. If you stack all these shots, you will get a sharp image of a planet. Uh, so with the pl for the planetary, it's a completely different animal. Uh, you don't need anything, you know, but the Dobsonian and the Barlow lens. Um, yeah, and the camera was a small pixel size because you know the, your planet is so small. Uh, it will be like if you take a photo, it, it, this will be the photo, and the planet will be like in the middle, like a small little dot. Uh, that's why having a smaller sensor with a small pixels, a high pixel density, will actually uh, you know reduce the field of view, so you kind of magnify this planet a bit more. Uh, so there. Are what are called the planetary cameras. And I, I can even show you the example of one of them. So it's over here. It's, it's crazy how small the sensors are on these cameras. See, the sensor is smaller than my fingernail, but I think it's a 12 megapixel sensor. It's roughly the same resolution that I have, uh, you know, on this camera. Side by side comparison. So this is a Fuji XC20. This is a crop 1.5 crop camera. The, 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 the size typically found. See how smaller it is? They have roughly the same amount of pixels. Uh, so the the um, yeah, this that's why you know they sell astrophotography cameras exactly for this reason. They will be really bad though for the deep sky astrophotography. Uh, objects photography. Why? Because the sensors are so small, they don't receive as much light as the big sensors, right? If you make a sensor bigger, it's the same way as if you make a telescope larger, they receive many more photons. Uh, that's why a full frame camera, for example, is a best kind of like a DSLR uh, camera that you can get for the astrophotography. That's why Canon 5D Mark II or Nikon D600 are so popular for the uh, deep sky astrophotography. And actually quite a lot of this uh, professional uh, deep sky astrophotography cameras use sensors from Nikon D600. Uh, and these cameras cost like $1,500, $2,000, $4,000. $4, Nikon D600 is, uh, you can get the used one for like $400. Uh, the main difference is that your Nikon D600 won't have the thermoelectric cooling like, like they do have here. Uh, so you kind of pay a very big premium for this. Uh, there are you know, ways to attach the thermoelectric cooling uh, to the sensors, however, but it's very hard to do. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. Uh, here is the same telescope that I have. Uh, but you can see that the person and the, you know, it's pretty much exactly the same setup that I have, but you see the person was very smart about, he, you know, how in the quaternal mounts you have to like counterweight, you have to put a counterweight balance to balance your uh, mount. He actually put the guide scope on the counterweight side, uh, which is really smart. And this is what I'm actually waiting uh, for the uh, adapter to come. Uh, so that I can do exactly the same thing. And hopefully it will allow me, uh, you know, to use uh, my mount with my telescope. Uh, I really hope so. Uh, so yeah, like astrophotography is a lot about engineering, um, a bit about art, and I think very small about science, at least on the beginner side. Um, yeah, that's it. If any Thank questions. you so much. 
That was great. Does anyone have any questions? Oh yeah, with the with the mask for the focus, um, I was curious how like what supplies you need to make your own. Yeah, uh, yeah. You can you can make your own mask from. Uh, oh, you can make your own mask from just cardboard. You can even make it from a paper. You know, you don't need much. You don't need it to be super solid, or. Uh, it doesn't actually have to be, uh, you know, dark. Uh, it doesn't have to block light. It just have to kind of introduce the distortion to the image that you have. You can make it from the paper, just print, you know, just print the uh, uh, the, the array. I know, I'm hard to talk. I don't know why. Just print it and just cut it with your scissors. Uh, that's it. It will work. And this is a, you know. Another thing why I got this telescope, it actually has a, this is a cap, by the way, of a telescope. It has a built-in Bakhtinov mask. And you see, it's actually not, it's actually transparent. It's a transparent mask. So yeah, just get a piece of paper, uh, draw with your hand, I don't know, uh, and it will already be good enough. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it will actually allow you to uh, get a perfect focus. And then if you see that your image is still not focused, you know you have a collimation problems. Yeah. I, I also had a question about filtering out, you know, light pollution. Yeah. When you filter out that like narrow band of, of wavelength, could you risk harming the actual image? Um, so the way that the... Um, uh, light pollution uh, filters work. Uh, they usually, you know, are like a bandpass filters. They allow for this uh, band and for this band to pass, and they block the rest of the band. Uh, this will not harm the uh, nebula uh, images. However, this will, uh, you know, reduce some signal from the images of the galaxies, for example, which are typically broadband. Uh, or, you know, it, it will also make stars dimmer, which actually very often you want to make stars dimmer. Because if you if you look on a lot of um, like uh, professional ast astrophotos, these are very, very well, you know, um, post-processed. Very often when you do the astrophotography, like when you take photos like this, your stars are really big because they are so bright. Uh, so sometimes you actually want to make them a bit dimmer, uh, to make them smaller, so they don't distract from you know from the main object that you want to image. So the, the short answer no, they should not um, uh, affect or reduce the image quality. They typically they don't transmit hundred percent here. They typically go like you know they block like ninety percent of the light here and then transmit ninety percent of the light here. They are not like perfectly efficient. Uh, but still, if you live in the Bortle 6, uh, you know, uh, area, definitely get the light pollution filter. And the light pollution filter is not going to save you if you live in Bortle 8 and above. Uh, it's just too bright. And LEDs are, you know, really killing the, the efficiency of the, of the filters. Got it. Thanks. Any any other questions? Doesn't seem like it. So we could probably stop the recording now and commence star dinner. <laughs>